Hello, and welcome to Crafting Revolution, the podcast. My name is Katie Freeman, and I'm one of your hosts. Every week, we bring you interviews of makers and artists of all kinds from all over the world, those that identify as female, non-binary, or transgender. Today's guest is Maya Anika. Maya Anika is a visual artist, cartographer, and mental health advocate based in Atlanta, Georgia. She earned her Bachelor of Art in Visual Arts from Agnes Scott College in 2014. Her work centers around discovering and exploring inner worlds, the intersections of color theory and mindfulness, drawing inspiration from several artists. She advocates for holistic approaches to mental health and wellness and invites others to facilitate their healing by practicing in the creative process through journaling and workshops. She recently led a workshop at the 2019 Yale Black Solidarity Conference of Fine Arts and Resilience. Her work has appeared at Decatur Arts Alliance, HOBI Studios, TILA Studios, and currently at Art of Touch Massage and Heal and Health Center in Midtown Atlanta. It was great to get to talk with Maya and learn about how she creates her um, maps of emotions, topography that intersects with so many things. Um, getting to learn about that process and doing some more thought about um, how that interacts with her, how that interacts with her audience. It was just great having those conversations. Um, Before getting into the chat with Maya, I want to remind you to please head on over to podcastawards.com and nominate and vote for Crafting a Revolution under the People's Choice Award category and the Art category. And also want to give a big shout out to the patrons over on Patreon. So thank you so much, Matthew from Artigiano Serio, uh, especially since you're our big main podcast sponsor this month. Thank you so much, Candice, CJ Woodgrain. Thank you, Lee at Lee Runyon, Annette 513 Woodworks, Katie Thompson, Women of Woodworking, Kevin Lefty's Woodshop, Christy Twisted Twine, Jeremy, Jeremy Spies, Sammy, Go Sammy Lee, Rachel, Moody Makes, Laura, Oakley Soap Company, Brandy, Studio Bay, Ellen, Little Bear Furniture, and Ethan, Ethan Carter Designs. Thank you all so very much for your uh, continued ongoing support, really helping to make this podcast happen every week. All right, let's head on into the conversation with Maya Anika. If you are good, we can get started. Yes. Get the get the like hardest part out of the way, which is I like to ask my guests to introduce themselves. Would you do that for me? Yes, I have no problem. <laughs> I, <clears throat> I I am Maya Anika. I am an artist, um, black expressionist artist, and I live and work in Atlanta, Georgia. Awesome. One of my uh, good friends lives and works in Atlanta also. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if I know them or, you know, the world's small, so we, I might bump into them. Yeah. Uh, her name is Ashar. Her Instagram is Wooden Maven, and she, like, loves to teach wood shop to kids and all kinds of people. So, cool. yeah. 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 Um, all right, so I want to know the story of Mia from like baby Mia to, you know, to what you're doing now. So tell me a bit about, you know, where'd you grow up and, you know, what kind of things were you interested in? All sure. that stuff. Yeah. Sure, sure. I'll get into it. So um, I'm born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I call myself a uh, southerner with some northern sensibilities. My parents were Yankees um, Mm -hmm. who came down here and that definitely impacted the way that I view the world and moved through it. Um, Dad's from Queens, my mom's from Bridgeport, so New York and New England. They both got me involved in the arts pretty early. Our mom took me to a lot of museums and different things like that. My dad was really invested in like and interested in like science and computer science. So I think that that's just shaped kind of my neural pathways and the ways that I engage with the world and the things that I enjoy doing. Um, So I went to school at Agnes Scott College. It is a 
fine women's liberal arts college in Decatur, Georgia. Um, and there I got a very good interdisciplinary approach to art and art making. Um, one of those rare departments where we had both art and art history together. Nice. So all of us graduated with um, all of us who, you know, attended the school and, and got our uh, training there got a really good understanding and grasp of like your art is made in a not in a vacuum but like you're situated somewhere specifically within uh you know social history and um and art history itself mm -hmm. and having some of those perspectives from womanism and feminism to sort of inform what we're doing and so that was all great and then after school um i started working a little more with um uh, NAMI and some other groups I got a, a huge interest in mental health and advocacy mm -hmm. and in the wake of everything that was happening with Trayvon Martin and the, black, the growth of the Black Lives Matter movement which is separate from the organization yep. um, and so having friends that go to the front line and come back and, and dealing with some different you know traumas and things just found some different ways to address those issues and areas with creative expression. So I took on a mantle of being a mental health advocate as well and found a way to blend those things with my work. And um, now <laughs> I operate as both. Um, I do some work in the community, um, some public artwork, but I also just paint, draw, design, and engage. Okay, awesome. So, <clears throat> I'm curious, when you were in school and you talked about like you had kind of the intermingling of like art and art history, yeah. was a lot of that art history or was any of it, I guess, do you feel whitewashed? Did, <laughs> did you learn, <laughs> did you have the opportunity to learn about um, some of the, I guess I call more of the true origins of a lot of the art in our world that has been whitewashed historically <laughs> absolutely and it's funny that you asked katie because um, <laughs> shout out to dr sadler um, <laughs> i actually used to butt heads quite a bit with our art history teacher um i think our first year in our first class there was like 200 people in the room and she asked me like why I wasn't engaged. It's like, if I must be honest with you, I don't care about Baroque. Yeah. I don't care about any of the back figures. I, this is just very disconnected from my experience in the world. And this is me yeah. quite a bit. But I, I said, where are the Black women? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny that you should bring that up because even now, um, there's still only roughly 3% of women of color and black women in particular who are represented in nationally recognized galleries and museums in, this, mm -hmm. in the United States. And I believe that the Guerrilla Girls group are those who are keeping up with some of these statistics. And so, um, yeah, the art world hasn't shifted very much. <laughs> <laughs> since my exploration. But I did get introduced to um, a variety of different women artists. Um, I definitely found out uh, who Degas and Picasso got their Cubist styles from and mm -hmm. what they were studying, whom they were studying um, in the different West African nations that they were visiting and coming back with these abstracted um, and geometric shapes and patterns. And so um, one thing I did learn there is the idea of cultural retention and I do carry that forward in my work mm -hmm. of course because I consider myself a cartographer a person who makes maps a person who explores actively mm -hmm. and um, I incorporate some different types of writings and, and hieroglyphs and different symbolisms and things and I just consider myself to be continuing in that kind of a tradition. Mm -hmm. um, some of my favorite artists to be introduced to, of course, um, studying abstraction uh, would be, of course, like Lee Krasner and Helen Frankenthaler, but also uh, Mary Lovelace McNeil, um, Alice Neal, the portraitist, because I love the way that she applied her colors and textures, um, Sam Gilliam. So yes, <laughs> <laughs> got a taste of all of that. 
it's wonderful. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I did ask a little bit selfishly because um, here just about actually a month from today, I'll be starting um, grad school to get a master's of fine art um, in 3D design. But part of that, because my undergrad wasn't in any form of art, <laughs> um, I have to take a little bit extra art history classes is kind of, you know, what they've asked me to do as, as a part of my program. And I just feel like going in, I'm kind of going in with like, okay, how mad am I going to make these professors? Because I feel like I'm going to continuously just be like, and can we circle back to the true origin of like what this comes from? Because like, I just, I, I mean, the reason I never did an art class in undergrad is like, I don't want to study old dead white guys. Like, that's not what I want to study. Um, so I, I feel like, yeah, I, I think I'm probably going to be a troublemaker in some of those classes. Um, Go for it. Go yeah. for it. I fully <laughs> encourage disrupting the canon and the idea of who makes work and whose work should be in the canon and what yep. should be represented and what should be um, exalted as an example of fine art even that term fine art gives me the heebie-jeebies like the separation between what you might find in a museum and what is considered folk art and fiber art and different things like that like <sighs> yep <laughs> I'm, I know, and I'm gonna get off my third box women have different ways of making and have traditionally always had ways of making and whether they were a part of a <laughs> whether they were a part of a society that you know had primary roles set out where one group was hunting and the other group was farming there was always some way of having everything organized and fitting yeah. aesthetic purpose and oftentimes a spiritual purpose in the way that things were arranged decorated etc so no matter what it was, whether it was in a domestic space and you're making quilts and things to keep the family warm, but also to hold memory, or you're talking about uh, star maps for astronomers on the roof of buildings or mm -hmm. et cetera, I believe there's always been a space for the sort of things that we've created, you yeah. know, earthenware. It's just that I believe that also a lot of women's group's work may have been more utilitarian and more mm -hmm. prone to wear and tear as a result because mm -hmm. it was useful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and even in folk art in different areas, like, you know, there's certain, there's a certain dials of the world. Love this mm -hmm. stuff. Scrap metal. Amazing, amazing assemblages. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there may be you know, you could consider quilts to be a, site, a type of assemblage. And I like seeing the work of like Rashid Johnson and some other folks that's coming forward that's, you know, collecting and putting things together in a different way. Anyway, yeah. off of my side, off my soapbox for that, but I don't think there should be so much of a separation because yes. what matters in art, in my humble opinion, is what resonates with a viewer. Yeah. And what resonates with them is often going to be reflective of their own life experience. Yeah, absolutely. Please disrupt. Please disrupt as much as you want in your master's thesis class. Please make sure they know that what they think they know is not indeed all that there is. Correct. I mean, I think that I, I do feel like that's kind of across the board, like just education in general, um, like even from elementary school on up, right? Like there are gatekeepers who are deciding like what gets taught. And a yeah. lot of that is whitewashed through the white lens, <laughs> like all of that stuff. Um, I mean, I appreciate my two kiddos. They, they go to, um, they do go to a private school, but it's highly focused on like nature and learning in nature. And really they teach the kids to question what we've been taught as history like you know they go through and they read like several different um accounts of like a historical event to understand like no it's not just this version that like the rest of this world wants to believe in so like i really look forward to seeing how like they move in the world and stuff and already they question you know like 
okay, this one person is telling me this is how this event happened, but perhaps we could look at it from the lens of the other side or, you know, that type of thing. Um, and I think art is very much in that realm. And I mean, a lot of the things, especially in the US, like a lot of the things that were made in the birth of this country, like made by hands, yeah. were, were, were not made by white hands. So <laughs> they were not made. So um, it just boggles my mind that we like tend to forget that. And we focus, you know, the higher education especially focuses on the well-to-do of people who had wealth, who had all of these things set out in front of them. And, and that's who we look at instead of like, even your term, like the terminology of folk art to me, I'm like, well, it's just art. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Made by people who didn't go to an academy. Exactly. <laughs> and I say that as someone with my privileged position of having been educated. But yes, having, you know, gone and got a second post-secondary education. Yes. 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 Um, I mean, that's one of the things I thoroughly, though, enjoy about, like, having this podcast is being able to talk to people across all spectrums. I have people on who create to me, just create art. And some come to it through life experience and some come to it through um, higher education training. But either way, to me, it's art. Um, and to your point, like some of the fabric artists that are coming up, um, especially some of the Black women fabric artists are amazing. Like I'm like in love with the quilts they're putting together. It's just mind blowing to me. Yeah, Lisa Butler. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, I I tried a few times. I got I I was bold enough to try a few times to get her on the podcast, and got told no. They, I got a response all times and told no. But I was like, please, please. <laughs> she an awful guess if she's ever interested in the future. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm curious you, so you talked about like the mental health aspect and that's kind of, you, you're weaving that in. Um, can you just tell me more about that? Like how, how you weave that into your work and what you do with that aspect? I can. So, um, I really do believe in the power of creative expression to um, not only be a method of release and expression of, of like your, your greater emotions, your deeper emotions, your fears, but um, I also believe in the process itself, mm -hmm. um, being able to unpack things, to rewind things, to revisit some places where you may have experience brokenness or some sort of abandonment or woundedness um, or even like the most um, exhilarating moments of your life and finding a way of capturing that with color and shape and sometimes with sound um, finding some different ways to approach um, looking at the interior of the person and their psyche as as a landscape that is um, almost literally what I try to do I flatten the self <laughs> as um, as I'm experiencing life and, and looking through things through um, a couple of different lenses. And um, I leverage the feelings wheel, if you're not familiar with it. Um, it is a chart that renders everything that we may possibly express, frustration, sadness, loneliness, um, uh, joy, to like our core, and most basic emotions like shame or disgust, sadness, um, happiness, you know, those are like your primary colors. So yeah, just yeah. Up your emotions, right? Um, and then there are others that branch out or become a combination. And those are the outer spokes of the wheel, the more complicated words that we don't always, you know, if I break this down, this feeling of hopelessness, what is it a combination of, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I leverage a little bit of color psychology, color theory. So it's like, okay, well, if we know that yellow makes you feel happy, 
happy, general happy colors or a surge of energy comes from looking at uh, uh, orange. Well, if I combine that with like a series of different lines and things, I am almost literally in the process of making, excavating, I'm going from the outside in. Yes. Um, and so that's a very, <laughs> that's kind of how I explain my work. So um, I think of it as uh, you think, I think of it as this, as we experience one mood and then another, there is the gap, the space in between, mm -hmm. the liminal space in between, um, where we are less certain necessarily of being grounded in that feeling. And those are the things I explore with the maps that I make. Um, use a lot of topographical lines, um, lines that would resemble like city streets and things as a way mm -hmm. of just wayfaring, almost literally like, okay, I find myself here. And here may be a very confused place. And I'm trying to get there to a less confused place. <laughs> I know that in the process of me creating these things or showing other people how to create them, that sometimes our goal, our thought of our goal is that I'm trying to get to a place where I no longer feel this, this negative or heavy feeling, right? Mm -hmm. And that my resolve might not actually be the point between A yeah. and B. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we actually have one of those uh, feelings wheels mounted on our, our wall. That's um, so helpful, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> they are. I mean, especially when talking with our kids, right? Like sometimes it's easier, especially the one we have, like has, you know, kind of emojis or faces that kind of express those uh emotions and feelings so that like even our youngest like maybe she doesn't know the word for something but can say like this is how I'm feeling um and it's really interesting as you described that because it was it felt like a light bulb moment for me of like oh it it is like I've never really even looked at that map before and seen it as like a color wheel but I'm like it totally is a color wheel like it, it totally is yeah um when you're like help when you're talking with others like you said that are part of that have you know gone to the front lines of like the black lives matter movement and such are you helping them create maps for themselves so i did start out doing that um I did come to um a couple of community-based uh forums and i may continue that work I'll be honest, uh, in the midst of COVID, I had to kind of rethink how I would address that, rethink mm -hmm. how I would approach that. Um, so, so far, it's a, it, this is a yes and a no. So far, um, I've done a few workshops in college settings and in control mm -hmm. settings, um, helped some kids draw out some maps as a starting point. It's like, we can get to where we color them in, but let's just try to yes. figure out <laughs> where you are let's figure out what the start button is and then we can track the journey that you might need to get to or what have you mm -hmm. um, so i don't have any current licensure or anything these yeah. are just I, I i call them the creative expression workshops mm -hmm. um yeah i i love to do these i'd love to do a couple more maybe for some activist groups um i've done a few um, but I, my primary group that I've worked with has been my college age students. Okay. Couple of years. It's just been a, an interesting pivot mm -hmm. um, because they're trying to figure out how to navigate being in <laughs> higher education mm -hmm. in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. and the shifting that's already, you know, challenging enough when you're leaving your parents' house for the first time, right? You're going into your own as, a, as an independent adult, you're trying to figure out what life might be. And the world yeah. may look a little bleak right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I feel all of that. <laughs> 100%. Um, since it feels like you're kind of already on that path, have you? thought about going into um being like an art therapist I have explored that um 
we will see <laughs> what happens um, as the world starts returning to a normal. Right. <laughs> um, we'll see what happens with that. But I, I was, I am interested in exploring it or in mm -hmm. at least learning how to leverage it quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Down for. Um, in the very least, I mean, this is a tool for me. If it doesn't, if it isn't for other people, I'm still seeking different ways to engage it. Um, one way that I am, you know, separate from the workshops, one way that I am able to engage it at a at a larger scale um, is to do public artwork as well. Um, and so there's a um, we have a couple of promise centers that were created um, in partnership with the National Black Arts Festival here in Atlanta. Um, I did create a pillar project. We, I was a part of uh, a group of artists that created some pillars mm -hmm. um, and just had some messaging that combined some of my, um, the map making, the cartography mm -hmm. work with symbolism from um, some traditional West, West African groups called NCBD. It's the same script that you may find in uh, Black Panther that they use mm -hmm. in the growing room and everywhere else. Like it's, it's an actual language system. Yep. Um, and I found, you know, worked with some, some students to get an idea of what their vision was for the future, like what their vision was for their neighborhood and what they would like to see happen, what would um, be hope for them, what would exemplify that for them. So um, I chose their color scheme. Um, so what you see out there, if you ever come down to Atlanta and you come to the Pittsburgh neighborhood, well, what you see out there is the colors that they chose. They love mm -hmm. electric green. That's what they associate with happiness. It's like, go for it. Um, yeah. <laughs> combine that with orange and some other things. And so um, I think that'll be for now the primary mm -hmm. way that I'm engaging. Just okay. about a bigger dialogue in yes. that I'm in. Have you ever overlapped or interwoven your kind of internal mapping with like actual cityscape maps? Starting to sort of do that. Okay. Um, so one of the things that um, prompted this uh, this recent development in my work is an expansion of what I, you know, originally started with, um, is wanting to find a way of grounding the work. That's where I am right now. Finding a way of grounding the work in something that at least seems real, even if it's not necessarily based in mm -hmm. a real place. Um, I've not actually employed literal maps, but I have studied like urban spaces mm -hmm. and the way that they construct those. Um, studied other earlier maps that may incorporate a little bit more like mythological creatures or something of that nature. Just mm -hmm. finding different ways to tell a very similar story. <laughs> yeah. And so um, some of the things I use to render, of course, there's topographical lines, which you, you ever see like a physical map. Those mm -hmm. are the lines that tell you how deep or how high something is. Um, and then I, do use a bit of a language system. It's a cynic writing, so it's almost like spontaneous writing to label things, to name mm -hmm. things, um, different colors, different symbols. And um, I do use a little bit more of a cityscape type approach to overlap. And so mm -hmm. I'm just building layers of yeah. complexity here. <laughs> yeah. I may start using specific neighborhood maps, but I might not label them that way. I will yeah. know still have it open to someone else's imagination and interpretation when they encounter the work. If I say that this is a particular mood that I am capturing, yeah. they're experiencing that. And rather than, I wonder where she was, you know, right. maybe. <laughs> maybe as a almost like a passport or a reflection yeah. of where I've been or others have been and that might be a project that I'm worth exploring. I I can envision I guess I see it in my head like I'm envisioning almost a like a laid out map with almost like heat zones mm -hmm. on on top of it you know um and I think you could get that by almost going around like Atlanta, like different parts of Atlanta are going to have a different vibe, different mood, different, you know, community sense. Um, yeah. 
and and yeah i think i think i'm guessing eventually you can almost um create a, a quilt work just out of all of your pieces of kind of the places you've been internally as you've gone along as well yeah i could i could that's definitely in the realm of possibility yeah idea of the realm of possibility i literally i see it it's not <laughs> <laughs> possibility is like a figure to say i'm like actually i could like see it almost yeah. like we're on an airplane and you yeah. see like the layers between the clouds like that space is where yes. i'm at <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i get it how do you how do you experience others interacting with your work it's always fun always a really fun experience for me to have someone see the work um humbling experience to have someone you know see the work in person mm -hmm. um, because I am currently explaining it to you <laughs> not always having like, like the context to right, right. It's like, okay, you're probably all quick when you see it yeah so once it's in person and in front of you um let's see a lot of feedback that I get is like, wow, it's super colorful. Um, but having someone connect with the work themselves and um, tell me that they can feel, you know, they can connect with what I was trying to evoke. Mm -hmm. um, always a fun, always a win-win. <laughs> uh, let's see, I think one of my best feelings from that probably came in 2019. There's some work that um, I had in a show in downtown Atlanta um, and two of them sold to Fulton County Public Arts and Culture. Hey y'all. <laughs> um, one was titled Brain Fog. It was very foggy looking. The palette was mostly cool, uh, cool, cool blues, purples, um, like red violets, those sort of colors. Mm -hmm. um, to kind of evoke that symptom of you know depression mm -hmm. where you're unable to or anxiety both where you're um, in a bit of a haze and trying to capture like your thoughts and your cognition your short term and your long term memory are both yeah. so, <laughs> on to details and 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 what that met, what that journey looked like and then there was a the other one was dysphoria you know the feeling of being displaced in your mm -hmm. body just the overall feeling of unease and that was captured with a lot of um, uh, diagonal lines, a lot of up mm. and down, a lot of a uh, misty sort of uh, misty sort of texture with a couple of different paints that I was using um, and ink and all these different things. And so uh, to have folks tell me like, okay, as soon as you told me what the title was, I got it. Mm -hmm. And nine times out of 10, I don't actually name them until mm -hmm. I'm finished. Um, I might have a palette in mind, like I'm, I'm feeling melancholy, but if I did that, I'd have like 20 pieces named melancholy. So I just wait <laughs> until the particular thing comes to me. What yeah. is the symptom? What is the syndrome? What is the mood? Um, so I named them dead last. It's the last thing I do. Okay. And so when the person asked me like, okay, what is it that I'm looking at? I can always explain. Mm -hmm. I know. This is precise definition that matches this. <laughs> <laughs> so this is definitely uh, a, a very intuitive process. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is going to be a personal question. I want to tell you, you are more than welcome to say pass you, or plead the fifth or whatever on this question. And that is, is, is this work is is mental health something that you've dealt with um through your lifetime like is this a it touches personally yes this does touch personally on a couple of different levels um and i won't out anyone else right. um, but speaking frankly yeah um so within my own family tree. I've been exploring some different things just so I can have better understanding of myself and how I operate. Mm -hmm. um, and I walk through the world with um, a thing called dysthymia currently. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I'm anxious, um, but it's a very persistent form of depression that never really goes away. 
never really goes away. It's, it's, it is running in the background on a constant basis. Um, and I started this work so that I could engage uh, more intuitively with, with that as I'm grappling with, you know, it's not a disability outright for me, but it could be. Mm -hmm. it could be. I definitely have had moments where I've needed to take some space away from things that were productive for me just so mm -hmm. I could contend with what was going on with me mentally and emotionally. Um, and I'm not ashamed to talk about that. <laughs> I have no shame. No. About I, I, I appreciate that. I do. I, yeah. I think that the more that you unpack these sort of things and encounter more people who are open about those sort of things mm -hmm. and the, the stigma goes away. And I believe, you know, most certainly when I started this work in like 2015, 2016, this was not a subject of discussion mm -hmm. and most certainly not for my community. Um, so it's just really encouraging to see more folks come out, um, different organizations and having different organizations to support. There's NAMI, of course, but then there's Silence the Shame, started by Shanti Das. Um, there's uh, No More Martyrs. There's, um, uh, I met a number of different influencers in the space as well. Mm -hmm. Hi, Yeti. Hi, <laughs> you know, so there's some different people who've also been brave and courageous mm -hmm. to come forward and share what their experiences are. Um, and I, not, I can speak for myself. Right. Else. I also see myself moving not away from the work, but shifting the way that I'm viewing it, inserting a little bit more distance so that I can mm. be more helpful to some other people. But yes, I've had some mental health struggles um, and I've helped other people through some of their own struggles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say uh, you're you're not alone. Like I su I suffer with persistent depression and uh, anxiety, and have my whole life, um, you know. But wasn't really understood or diagnosed until I was an adult. Um, Gotta love that. I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm I I one thing that probably I'm most thankful about is because I understand all of this now. Um, I can be a, a resource for my kids and understanding, you know, when they're having struggles and even just understanding like, okay, maybe, maybe we as a family need to get more help in this area because I don't understand this or, or whatever. And I think um, that that's just beneficial for everybody all around but I do know like previous generations like never sought help and that's not um that was not helpful for me I'll put it that way I can always speak for myself in that regard um but yeah I think there's a lot of us who are creatives who probably do struggle at least on occasion um with mental health I know that for me the physical act of making definitely saves my life because that's sometimes the only way I can get out of my head is to actually make something. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a couple of ways that, um, there's a couple of ways that I look at it. So on the one hand, um, I really do firmly believe that art is, art heals, art heals. Mm -hmm. um, in the very act of creating, it's almost all chemical, you know? Uh, I am producing something. This is a constructive activity. Therefore, whatever it is that I may also hear in the back of my head about myself and my abilities and my limitations, I am still capable right. <laughs> of creating this thing. And so all of that, that process ends up negating the voice mm -hmm. that says otherwise, um, the critical voice that says otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, you can, I, I think that there are some folks that create from, uh, create out of the chaos, mm -hmm. for a better term. Yeah, there's folks that create out of the chaos. Um, and then there's folks that create after they've dealt with the chaos. And I am, uh, <laughs> depending on the day, a bit of both. <laughs> depending on the day, I can be either or. And I, I tend to, I think what I want to move towards is, um, as I'm growing, as I'm healing, as I'm understanding myself better, moving towards an artist who has lived with mental health struggles, 
and <laughs> <laughs> and performs, produces. Yeah. Like, yeah. As as opposed to producing out of that space. Yeah. It creates a lot of really awesome energy. Maybe frantic energy. Yes. <laughs> Um, it's fun harnessing chaos, you know, it's like putting mm-hmm. a lasso around a tornado. I'd like to do a little differently now. Mm-hmm. I would like to produce in all seriousness, produce from a healthy place. Mm-hmm. And I think that nine times out of 10, that's, the, that's also the goal. Mm-hmm. And healing's not linear or straightforward. Unfortunately. <laughs> Again. Here we talk <laughs> here, people. Stand and, and accept that you will hit different milestones at different times. As long yes. as you're committed to the process and you're and you're consistent, it is okay. Also, healthy coping mechanisms. Yes. I advocate <laughs> for those. Not yeah. so judgment, but I advocate strongly. <laughs> yes. Well, I thank you for for. Uh, being open and honest with your answer. I really do appreciate that. And I know um, for those who listen, that will probably, it will probably help more than one person to understand like, okay, we're cool. Like <laughs> it's not alone. Um, Cause that's the other sometimes benefit, sometimes downside, right. As a artist or a maker, you can spend a lot of your time alone Um with your thoughts and again that's not always the best position uh to be in depending on how um how you're feeling how your mood is sometimes like it's nice to have interaction with others because that can kind of pull you out (laughs) yeah yeah it's always um uh, an old friend of mine used to tell me you just show up however you're feeling or thinking, you just, as an artist, as a creative, you just need to show up. Mm-hmm. Really, your best, not your idealized best. Right. Our <laughs> best today. Yes. <laughs> it may not always look the same from day to day, from moment to moment, but showing up is the important thing. Oh, um, another shout out real quick, promise. Um, Dear Artists with Anxiety, it is a group start by this awesome person named Benz, Ed Amaya, I think I'll pronounce her name right. Um, great support for artists who um, wrestle with anxiety and other mental disorder things as, you know, forging community. Mm-hmm. And so I'm thankful to be a part of that. <laughs> Well, thank you for that shout out too. I'm learning all these new resources from you today. I appreciate it. I'll, I'll send you all of them in an email. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. What's your favorite color? What's my favorite color? Yeah. What's your favorite color? Usually purple. Um, purple or teal. I kind of go between those two. Sense. Teal is a really calming color mm-hmm. in general. Um, reminds most folks of the ocean, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And jewelry, which doesn't ever make a girl feel terrible. Um, <laughs> and then purple, uh, purple is linked to a lot of uh, clarity. Um, ironically enough, clarity, uh, some spiritual energies, um, loyalty, royalty. It connotes mm-hmm. a lot of different things, and so its presence is also really awesome. I love purple. <laughs> it is my favorite. Um, friends who have observed me in studio <laughs> have told me, I see you attempting to move away and try different palettes, but you just land <laughs> in the purple region. I said, you know what, I'm just going to, we're just, just going to be okay. Yeah, with yeah, you. yeah. <laughs> I'm not monochromatic <laughs> purple. <I'm- laughs> Uh Uh, they told me that it's like yeah you try to lean away it's like yes I try to warm a palette we're gonna go with purple (laughs) I do try to use a lot of teal and and different things to sort of balance out Mm -hmm. yeah I add um I frequently add color to my woodwork pieces when they're my pieces um 
I use uh, dye for clothing to dye my wood. And so um, I always bring out something, but it, to me, to honestly, what I, now that you say that, what I usually land on is some, some shade of teal <laughs> is usually where I land when I'm adding color, when it's my own uh, creation. <laughs> I think that works. I think that's an effective strategy. Most think it's rainbows. Like maybe I make a lot of very multicolored, like bright. Work. Right, right. But you know, <laughs> a patch of teal in a corner of a room and set it off. It's so that's cool. right. That's right. <laughs> It fits almost any aesthetic, just about. It's yeah, yeah. My favorite non-neutral. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, of course, when I take commission work, then I'm doing colors that, you know, they ask me to do, which is fine, too. Um, I actually do like it a lot when people ask for orange, because that's a fun one to play with. But, um, yeah, yeah. Usually, if I'm left to my own devices, no matter how hard I try it, like I'm mixing other colors, it still ends up teal. And I'm like, okay, let's just go with it. <laughs> when the process is intuitive, it makes sense. It makes yeah. Sense. <laughs> like that it's both art and science, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, we may not be as directly, you know, direct chemists necessarily yes. as makers, you know, if you're mm -hmm. a maker. Um, but understanding how like different pigments interact, how inks interact. Um, I use a mixture of different materials in my work. Mm -hmm. So primarily ink and watercolor right now, they're very portable and they're very portable materials. So do you, do you mix the two together? Are you using both mediums? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, most of the time I layer, I, mm -hmm. layer. So I start with, I might, I'll start with the lines and I'll start with the lines and then a wash. Okay. And then another layer of lines and then mm -hmm. some more washes. And um, ink is a shortcut because it's saturated to try to build things up with watercolor. So it really just depends. Um, yeah. We use acrylic paint, um, use wax. I like wax sticks. They're very fun. Mm. And they can sit on top of and create some different interesting yeah. texture. Um, and they can bleed into the next layer in a different way. So it's a way of almost using oil, but not really. Well, with the ink and the watercolors, I mean, yeah, the watercolor isn't gonna stick to the ink, right? It's gonna roll right off of that. That's right. So whatever I put down, I better be certain of the yeah. mark. Because <laughs> I like ink. If I make a quote mistake, I just have to pivot with it. Yeah. Maybe that's a nice metaphor for life. Whatever <laughs> You know, like, well, wherever it goes, where it's going. So <laughs> somebody bumps my elbow. It's it's a done deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at the same time, like using ink at the base, that's um, it's pretty meditative for me too. Yeah, yeah. Going through and very carefully, as intentionally as possible, laying mm -hmm. down the groundwork for what will be a awesome composition when it's done. Yeah, I, I also get that. I mean, that's, um, I power carve, which is usually angle grinder, and I'm just creating, you know, curved shapes as I go along, and um, it's the same thing, right? If I make it, if I mess something, like, it's there. It, I got to go, okay, there's going to be a divot there now. What are we going to create around it to make it look intentional? Um, Added some character. Yes. <laughs> This is a one of a kind piece. I will literally never replicate this again. That's right. <laughs> uh, but that's one of the reasons I love it is also because like re really anybody else who looks at it has no idea that that was, a, you know, was not intentional at all. Um, and so it it's more of like, kind of like you said, it's more work on myself and it gives me more time to pivot and spend time with myself versus um just having that knowledge that nobody else knows and so it's all about me in that regard <laughs> so. that's what i like about art making is it's 
it's an evolution for everyone who's involved from the mm -hmm. people who are making the material that we work with our substrates our pigments our our source material i guess mm -hmm. um, and god because he grows trees <laughs> um, so there's that yes and then, <laughs> Then there's us, the artists, producing the work, interacting with these materials in real time. Um, and then there's the audience member who gets to experience what that process was. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they may never know how many layers right. are in between them and this, this thing that they're now experiencing as a whole. Yep. Um, and that's true for people. Mm -hmm. you know? Yep. Exactly. I love it um we are i think that's like the perfect metaphor to, to end on because we're <laughs> at the end of our time so um i want to give you a chance to let people know like how they can find you and see your work and stuff online awesome okay so you can find me on my website um www.miainika.com um, you can email me if you're interested in um, any work in particular, or you want to commission a work, or you want me to do a workshop for your group, um, info at miainik.com. And then, um, of course, you can find me on Instagram at art underscore miainika. <laughs> <laughs> I am my Anika on almost all platforms. There we Say go. Hello. <laughs> questions. <laughs> Love it. Um, well, thank you for chatting with me today. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you, Katie. Thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So again, that was Maya Anika, and I'll include the links on how you can follow along with her in the show notes for today's episode. Best places to find that is the description on your podcast app for the episode. And if you're watching on the Freeman Furnishings YouTube channel, check the description box down below. Be sure to follow along with the podcast on Instagram at Crafting a Revolution. Um, all one word, all no spaces, underscores, any of that at Crafting a Revolution. Say hi to your hosts, myself, Katie Freeman at Freeman Furnishings, and my co-host, Katie Thompson at Women of Woodworking. We love to interact with those that uh, listen to the podcast and learn about how you create. Uh, also, big shout out and thanks to um, Ashley Minnie for writing and producing the theme song for the podcast. Um, I still absolutely love it. And I know those that listen love it too. All right. Back next week with one brand new episode. In the meantime, as always, let's go craft a revolution. She, her,